Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about intergenerational trauma. We're joined by Natalie Gutierrez, author of The Pain We Carry. She's founder of Mindful Journeys Marriage and Family Therapy, PLLC, and a licensed marriage and family therapist working primarily with BIPOC survivors of complex trauma, ranging from racial trauma, sexual trauma, attachment trauma, and intergenerational trauma. Natalie is a certified internal family systems therapist and prospective trainer at the IFS Institute. Hi, Natalie. Thanks so much for joining us on Evidence-Based. Thanks so much for having me, Cassie. I'm excited to be here and have this conversation with you. I think this is going to be such an important conversation. So I want to start off with just identifying what is intergenerational trauma? Yeah. So, you know, how I understand intergenerational trauma, I think folks also call it generational curses, generational cycles, generational curses are really just burdens, beliefs, patterns, energies of pain and grief particularly even traumatic grief that's passed down throughout the generations that is inherited from elders, from ancestors, when we think about ancestral trauma and what informs the trauma passed down throughout our families, like patterns of abuse, patterns of addiction, just patterns of all the harm that is inherited in our family, things we learn, right? That don't even have to necessarily be explicitly stated, just things that are even implicit that we just know because we know because we see it modeled to us. Uh, and, And also because of the energetic fields that we grow up in, these kind of things really impact how our families navigate and uh, navigate closeness, navigate dynamics of relationships within themselves, right? Within the family unit, how they see themselves, how they see the world, how we're parented, how our parents or caregivers were parented and so on and so forth when you go back into the generation. So it's really, you know, how I understand intergenerational trauma is all of that pain, all of that hurt all of the wounding that gets passed down throughout the generations through attachment trauma and also epigenetically too, right? When we think about all the things that have have had to happen, like for our nervous systems to navigate and survive the systems that, you know, we were navigating or the historical trauma that our ancestors have had to navigate, that this informs how our bodies need to change to adapt. And so this also is intergenerational trauma because our nervous systems have had to adapt. And this, again, also was inherited and passed down throughout the generations. And you mentioned uh, attachment wounding. Can you talk about what that is when it comes specifically to intergenerational trauma? Yeah. So, you know, when I think about attachment wounding and what in general, like what we learn in, in, in our programs and in clinical programs and stuff is, you know, we, we see attachment wounding as the wounding uh, that happens with caregiver and children, right? So if our caregivers were neglectful emotionally or physically, or if they were abusive physically, emotionally, sexually, that this creates insecure attachment, this creates anxious attachment, this creates avoidant attachment, or a little bit of both, anxious avoidant or what some folks call disorganized attachment. And so, you know, it's known to be the dynamic that creates a lot of insecurity and dysregulation between caregiver and child. And I also understand attachment wounding as a more systemic, broader kind of concept, which is really like, well, we think about how even parenting trauma or attachment wounding given comes from, it goes further back than just caregiver to child ruptures and attachments and security and safety. I also see attachment wounding as what happens historically when people have been removed or displaced from their homelands. It is the rupture that has happened between people and their sacred homelands, their ancestors, 
unknown and known, right? Being seen and unseen when you are taken from your environment, when you are, or when your environment is stolen from you through colonization or when you are taken from your land through enslavement, right? Through forced separation, that that also is attachment wounding. This is stuff that, you know, you are rooted to your land, you're rooted to your homeland. And when that's taken from you, there is definitely a loss of identity and a loss of attachment to things that are not just human, but, you know, other, other beings, right? Other beings, the land, so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's really broad. It's not just in the home. It's historical. Yeah. Yeah. I think what happens in the home really is a symptom of what has happened historically. And that's just, again, part of the intergenerational trauma, part of the inheritance of the pain that we carry, right? (laughs) I was just going to say that. (laughs) It's part of the inheritance of that is is through the historical trauma, what happened that was traumatic, that was stolen, that was taken, that just really negatively impacted us in all of the ways. That also is attachment rupture and attachment wounding. Absolutely. In the home, in your book, you talk about childhood experiences and in that you categorize three types of stress. Can you talk about those? I learned this from my mentor, Dr. Eric Gentry, who learned this from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris when there were studies going out about childhood stress and the three childhood stress were identified as positive stress, tolerable stress, and toxic stress. And the first one, positive stress is like, you know, the stress that a child experiences or that we experience when like, you know, it's the first day of school, right? If we're starting a new school, there's like a, an energy of maybe like anxiousness and maybe a friend tells us that they don't like us that day or we were treated I don't know, someone said something mean to us. And when that happens, the child comes to us and says, this happened to me today. And they're met with secure attachment. They're met with someone that is holding them, holding space for them, reinforcing them, you know, reassuring them, saying nice things to them. And like, just really met with supportive care, right? (laughs) That doesn't have to be traumatic. And in fact, that can actually help to create some resilience, some um, self-competence, right? When you're able to get to the other side of things and you're able to say, well, you know what, that that was hurtful, but I rose above it, right? I was able to navigate it and I feel more confident. I can do that next time because I've navigated it already, right? So that's positive stress. You are met with support when there is a, um, a moment of stress and it's not prolonged, it's a moment of stress and that can actually help us. And then there's tolerable stress which could be, and this isn't true for everyone, again, depending on it, if you're met with supportive care or not, tolerable stress could be if you're bullied or um, if you experience um, sexual abuse, if there was an incident of sexual abuse or just any sort of sexual betrayal, sexual misconduct, and you told an adult or caregiver and you were met with support they believed you because that's really important, right? They believed you and you felt again that you were held and you were seen and you were believed. There's space there for you to be able to not have that be entirely traumatic for the moment that can definitely be traumatic and you can work through that, but with support, you can persevere, right? You can get past that with support, with community care and all of that. That's tolerable stress where it was hurtful, it was painful and you were able to navigate through it and you didn't actually, it didn't get you stuck. Unlike the third type of stress, which is toxic stress. And that is kind of like when we think about ACE scores, Dr. Nadine Burkara talked a lot about this. It's the adverse childhood experiences. This is where you have a lot of, even ongoing exposure to traumatic stress where you don't even know when it's going to end because it just kind of keeps going. And sometimes there's even an accumulation of that stress and it's toxic because not only is it ongoing, but you're also not met with supportive care. Maybe you're abandoned or you're not believed if you experience sexual trauma or you were blamed, you were scapegoated. Like these are things that then really create toxic stress and that wreaks havoc on on the body. 
that is what really harms the nervous system because now the nervous system has, has to adapt to the trauma, the traumatic experiences that are happening. And then that's how we get the hypervigilance that we feel. That's how, you know, our nervous system goes into fight or flight or freeze. That's how we start developing coping mechanisms, maladaptive coping mechanisms, protective coping mechanisms that really, and I said the word maladaptive, but really not saying that as a judgment, but just more of like things that are you know, unhealthy that really, that really sabotage us, but really are only trying to serve a purpose to protect us from that harm. So those are the three types of stress in children. And as you can see, toxic stress is really the most hurtful, the most toxic and painful. And the, the toxic experiences you're talking about create trauma and can compile on each other. And I think this leads us to talk about complex PTSD a little bit. Can you tell us what that is and then how intergenerational trauma plays a role in that? Yeah. So complex trauma, how I understand it, is from that toxic stress. It is that ongoing exposure to trauma or traumatic experiences, I'll say, that really does not end. Like when you think about, okay, tell me a time where you maybe felt unloved and you kind of say, well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know a time where I didn't feel unloved. I don't know that a time that I did feel safe. I don't know. Uh, I can't tell you a time that like there, there's just an ongoing thing. You don't know a specific time. It's just, it's ongoing. It's uh, ongoing exposure to pain and traumatic grief that then rewires the nervous system to really, and, you know, in the spirit of survival really, but then starts to, really create activation and triggers in the nervous system that are not just somatic or not just what they call like sensory triggers. So it's not just when you think of combat veterans that go to war, right, that have PTSD, that when they hear maybe fireworks, it reminds them of gunshots. It's not just that sensory experience that creates trauma. For complex PTSD, it's also emotional triggers. And that's what makes it complex. I've heard a lot of people say the, you know, like when caregivers or their parents have said, you're too much or you're too needy. You're too much, you're too needy, be quiet, you know, be silent. And fast forward in adulthood, people hear that maybe from their significant other their partner or partners will hear, you're too much, you're asking for too much, you're needy. That phrase becomes really activating because it's activating a core wounds. It's activating an attachment wounds within, right? It's activating a memory of, or memories (laughs) of abandonment or abuse. And so that phrase or those phrases or any phrase really and this this also includes racial slurs right like it becomes very activating why because it brings us back to so many other memories where we've heard those things and that has felt very life-threatening to us it's really led us to feel powerless or helplessness and that's that that's what creates that trauma is that feeling of where you're frozen where you're powerless and you're helpless because these things keep happening and happening and happening and maybe trying to shrink you, maybe trying to erase you, minimize you, dehumanize you for sure. These are the experiences that really then become very activating for our nervous system. And then for so much of the time, we talk about hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is that expectation that bad stuff is going to happen. Right. And so you're already walking around so much of your time guarded, so much of your time protective of yourself from the outside environment. And that makes sense. Right. If you've been abused as a child and also if your identities that, you know, are marginalized have also been abused and dehumanized or trying, you know, or have experienced cultural genocide and erasure like there there's activation in the nervous system every day for so much of the time for so many people and that's complex trauma 
because of the toxic environments in which we navigate and exist in every single day. Well, you mentioned hypervigilance as a, a main component of this, but are there other ways that complex PTSD shows up specifically for those marginalized groups and people of color? Yeah, I mean, hypervigilance is definitely one of them. And there's also like shut down as well. Like there's also just a, a despondence, you know, apathy. Sometimes I, I've seen it that way, just a numbing out because when you're on, right? When you're hypervigilant for so long, at some point, our bodies say, I can't. And so you swing into another protective, you know, another protective mechanism, which is really just like, I'm gonna, I have to numb out because there's so much happening in the brain. There's so much happening in the body that I have to really dissociate from it a little bit, or I have to really just numb out because it's too much. When it's unexpected and when you know that it's going to happen, right? When you know that you're going to go out into the world, we're, you know, existing in a, in, a, in a racist and oppressive system, systems, there's, you're probably going to experience a microaggression. It just makes sense to me then how you're going to want to protect yourself in the ways that you know how, that it maybe have been modeled to you, right? Intergenerationally, when we think about um, intergenerational trauma, it just makes sense because we are wired to want to survive things. And so our bodies and our nervous systems are so magnificent and they're going to just do what they do and what they need to do for us to survive, whether that's dissociating, numbing, being hypervigilant, whatever needs to get done is going to get done. But the problem becomes that when we are in these states, whatever they are, fight, flight, or freeze, or fawning, right? People-pleasing, when we're in these states, eventually over time, these things can create medical conditions in our bodies, cardiovascular issues. If your heart is constantly palpitating, right? There are just so many, there are so many. And if, you know, if we do the research, there's just so much research about the racial and ethnic disparities of autoimmune conditions, of cardiovascular issues, of diabetes and these things. I mean, this it's just so connected. It's so connected to epigenetics. It's so connected to the larger systems. It's so connected to even environmental injustice. It's so connected to food insecurity and who has access to healthy foods and who doesn't, who has access to financial empowerment and who doesn't when it comes to marginalized identities. So all of this is connected systemically and intergenerationally and also personally. The body just so exhausted from carrying all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When I was reading your book, I was interested by the cultural legacy burden. I wonder if you could talk about that and how it's transmitted. Yeah. So I learned about the terms cultural legacy burden and legacy burdens and personal burdens from um, a therapeutic modality called uh, internal family systems, which was developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz. Um, and also, um, I want to say inspired by the idea of multiplicity, meaning that we are not just one thing, right? That we are multiple parts. We have just, we're multiple beings within. Um, and that that idea or that understanding of multiplicity is really grounded in indigenous practice and understanding. So I just want to name that. And so the term cultural legacy burdens is really the understanding. When we think about burdens, burdens are energies, they're narratives, you know, stories and beliefs that we carry that that impact how we see the world and also how we see ourselves. So in the larger construct, cultural legacy burdens are, you know, the cultural traumas that we carry, the cultural traumas that, that are perpetuated by the larger systems like racism. Well, um, internal family systems has coined four significant cultural legacy burdens, but we have much more than four. But the four um, that I name in my book are the cultural legacy burden of racism, the cultural legacy burden of individualism, of materialism, and of patriarchy, because those are the four significant ones. But cultural legacy burdens are also all of the isms that we carry. So 
um, I'm just thinking about transphobia, homophobia, ableism, right? Sexism, classism, capitalism, these, just to name a few, because there are more, <laughs> but there's just these larger, these larger beliefs, these larger energies that are there that really impact then how our institutions also treat us, right? It impacts the laws that govern us. It impacts all of that. So cultural legacy burdens are like the broader umbrella of the isms and xenophobia and all of that that we hold. And then that, you know, when we live under these systems, we go to schools that perpetuate these things. We work in places that perpetuate, right? We Again, we all exist under these systems. So we all internalize these isms and just ways of seeing other people in the world that pours over into uh, family legacy burdens and family legacy burdens are what we were just talking about before, like intergenerational trauma and how that can look like in families when it's informed by cultural legacy burdens is, you know, through colorism or anti-blackness within our communities, including communities of color. Again, it's it's the trans it's transphobia, it's the gender binary that we all have internalized, right? That we've all seen, we navigate the world through a binary construct. And we learn more and more that, you know, gender varies and is ex ex expansive. And so it's all of these things that we learn from the larger culture that we take in and then we parent in this way and we see each other in this way and we see our neighbors in this way too. All of that, the cultural legacy burdens creates the family legacy burdens, which then the way we're parented, we talk about attachment wounding, creates some of the personal burdens that we carry along with the interpersonal racism that we experience through microaggressions, right? And also growing up in schools that are hurting us, um, that are mistreating us. So we are also traumatized, you know, directly there. So the cultural burdens also alongside historical trauma create those uh, family legacy burdens, AKA the intergenerational trauma that exists within our families. It's all connected, all yeah. connected. Earning your continuing education hours doesn't have to be a painful experience. The right course can open your mind to new possibilities, increase your confidence, and hand you powerful tools to transform your clients' lives. Praxis Continuing Education and Training teams up with some of the brightest minds in mental health to provide cutting edge, evidence-based training for practitioners. You can learn firsthand from experts like Stephen C. Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Robin Walzer, Kirk Strausel, and many others. Find your next training at praxiscet.com. That's praxiscet.com. So I want to shift our conversation for the rest of it a little bit more about solutions and healing. What is the cultural empowerment approach to healing? I created the cultural empowerment approach to healing. I've been a therapist for 14 years and after really having the honor to sit across from people and hear their vulnerable stories, I began to really think about or question really, how do we kind of have a real holistic approach to healing? What does a, what does a holistic approach to healing really look like? How do I, how do I see that? And so the cultural empowerment approach to healing is supposed to be something that integrates how we can begin to heal our minds, how we can begin to heal our bodies and our spirits, and really also intertwine or incorporate activism in that and also ancestral practices. Because a lot of, uh, for, for a lot of folks of the global majority, they have been taken away. We talk about again, attachment rupture, the ancestral practices that were curated by our ancestors that were supposed to be healing were robbed were you know we were, we were we were taken from that they were vilified right it was seen as evil and so we were forced for a lot of our our, our ancestors were forced to assimilate and acculturate to you know more dominant culture and so it's about reclaiming all of that it's about reclaiming our bodies. It is about reclaiming our inner children within us. 
It's about developing a relationship with all the parts of us, right? Integrating internal family systems and parts work. It's about seeing ourselves so that we can also see other people. It's about forgiving ourselves. It's about really getting to know and being curious about the shame that we also hold and how we can offer ourselves self-compassion the same way that we're so good about offering other people kindness and self-compassion that we <laughs> do that to ourselves, that we offer that to ourselves and accessing the energy of ancestral wisdom and ancestral medicine and connecting with our ancestors, known and unknown, and even curating our own healing practices and our own, you know, through journaling or through plant medicine, however it feels right for us. And then really living intentionally to change an unjust system, because I think we're all part of the system too. And because of the internalized racism and internalized oppression that we've also been impacted with in, you know, varying degrees, um, we also perpetuate harm many times to our own communities and others. And so we also have to really begin to become introspective on the ways that we do that and heal ourselves so that we can continue to push back against the systems that are hurting us. Self-awareness seems to be a really important part of all this work. Very, very much. <laughs> because I just don't see, Cassie, how we are going to heal ourselves and heal the collective if we are not aware of the pain that we're carrying and how we also sometimes even inadvertently and unconsciously perpetuate that pain. And that's, you know, it's a snowball effect. It keeps happening. So awareness is very important alongside intention so that we can really witness ourselves. Because a lot of the pain we also carry is because we live much of our lives not being seen when, you know, larger systems in society serves to dismiss our pain, right? Minimize our pain or invisibilize us, then it's really important to see ourselves. When we see ourselves, we can also see the humanity in others. And when we do that, we heal ourselves to help heal our communities, to help heal the world. But it starts with really getting curious and witnessing ourselves. Absolutely. I wanted to ask, so when someone is self-aware and can recognize their own trauma responses, what are some ways that they can learn to relax those responses? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I think it's going to look different for different people. However, you know, how I understand things is I, I really want to invite folks to bring it back to the body first. And the reason for that is because if we go into trying to tell ourselves that we are safe right away, and this, again, this is true, this this may work for, pe for some folks and for, for some folks not, but if we go straight into like positive affirmations, if we are in an activated space within our bodies, we're probably not going to be able to take in those positive affirmations. We're probably not going to be able to, if we're telling ourselves, you know, I am enough, I am powerful, I can navigate through this. If we're in an activated place, that's not going to really seep in to our bodies. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not going to be fully be able to take that in. And so for me, it's, um, my understanding is really just bringing it first into the body. And so that could be taking a deep breath, right? Or breathing regularly, but maybe being more mindful about how you're breathing. It can be doing a body scan, starting from the top of your head, going to the tip of your toes and just noticing where in your body you're carrying tension or pressure or heat or hardness and just noticing what that's about. And you might even ask in that moment, like what's happening for me right now? What am I picking up from my environment, right? Because we're picking up, we're getting cues from the environment about safety and danger. And so when we're feeling tense in our bodies, we're picking up on danger. So, and a lot of this is also unbeknownst to us. So I want to say, bring it back to your body. If it feels okay and it works for you, do a body scan or just breathe into your body 
and just release, just release, just envision tension leaving your body or just envision tension leaving your breath, however it feels right for you. But just notice what's happening in your body so that you can relax into a calm body. And then you can move into telling yourself affirmations that, you know, that have worked for you in the past or creating affirmations for yourself. But it's always going to come down to going back to your body in the ways that feel right. It could even be like holding your hand or, you know, giving yourself a hug if you feel okay with that, right? But just going back to the somatic and the body first before you move into affirmations and any other things like that. It sounds like beginning with the body is almost a, a great way to sort of meet yourself where you're at. Mm-hmm. And also to feel yourself, like to feel your heart, right? What's what's happening there? You know, what's happening there for me? Or, or you know, what's it trying to tell me? What is this tension in my chest this, or this knot in my throat? What's it trying to tell me? What am I afraid of? Getting curious, bringing curiosity and awareness to what's happening in your body. Because you might even say, oh, I, I'm feeling this, if I have a knot in my throat, right? I'm feeling this, this knot in my throat because I'm afraid. Maybe I'm about to speak on a podcast <laughs> or you know, do public speaking or I'm about to tell someone something and I'm afraid of conflict or what does that mean? Because that's all information and that's a, a, what internal family systems post a trailhead to follow for information about ourselves. And we talked a little bit about it much earlier in the conversation, but what role does self-compassion play in this work? Oh, everything. I really feel like everything. And it goes back to, I've never met a person that was kinder to themselves and not kinder to other people. I always see people just being the most loving people to others, that holding space for other people, really like giving their last dollar to other people, just being so kind and loving and compassionate to others. And then when it comes to themselves, that negative talk, that hurtful, painful self-talk is like, damn, you're stupid. Or oh, you shouldn't have done that. It's really shaming. And so if we can move into a place of understanding, maybe understanding, but at the very least compassion, because you don't have to understand to necessarily be compassionate. But if we can move into that place of like, wait a minute, why am I really feeling this way? Oh, it makes sense to me because I'm afraid that if I, if I set a boundary with this person, using that as an example, I'm, I'm afraid to set boundaries with this person because I'm afraid if I set them, maybe we're going to get into a conflict or maybe they're going to reject me or maybe they're going to leave me. And what does that bring up for me? Where in my past has that happened? Oh, it's reminding me of this last relationship or it's reminding me of my parents that left. We then can see when we stay with ourselves and stay with that discomfort and follow that trailhead back to where else has this happened? In our, in our story, where else has this happened in our past, we can make space for more, little by little, for more compassion for ourselves. And when we can feel more compassion for ourselves, less shame is going to live within us. Less resentment of ourselves is going to live within us. And there's going to be so much more space for love for us, for caring for ourselves, because there is more openness and more willingness to see ourselves and care for ourselves the way that we care for other people. Self-compassion is everything in the healing work, I believe. Oh, so important. So important. When it comes to healing intergenerational trauma, what are some ways that people can begin to break those generational curses? And why is that so important? Because it's going to continue to be perpetuated and, and, and these curses will get stronger and they'll just, they won't die if we're not, if we're not, if the intention is not to really shed light on them and move away from them. And also it doesn't happen overnight. So this is where self-compassion comes in because we have been wired both individually and, you know, as a family and also as a collective, we have been wired certain ways because we've adapted to the environments that we've grown up in. And so 
this is, you know, generational work and it takes generations to heal from it in the same ways that it took generations to create it. So, you know, I think that when we talk about the how and how to, to break generational curses, it's really going to be one about witnessing, right. And getting clarity about what these things are. And so one of the things is like, y'all, we got to talk about it. (laughs) One of the burdens that really exists within our families is the burden of secrecy, right. And also the burdens of shame, but legacy burdens are fueled by shame. And when we have to hold things secret because we're not speaking about them as a family, it creates shame. It creates shame. And I'm just thinking about the, you know, the Disney movie Encanto and how there was no, I mean, that's a beautiful depiction of intergenerational trauma that was caused by historical trauma. And there was no discussion about the traumatic grief that had lived in that family. Sorry, the spoiler <laughs> for those that haven't watched the movie. <laughs> no one talked about it. And there's that famous song, we don't talk about Bruno, right? We don't talk, we don't talk about the truth. <laughs> we don't talk about the truth of the hurt and the wounding and the pain that is unresolved, that is just living in our family and manifesting in so many different ways. Um, And also in the ways that maybe we're unable to have relationships or have close relationships or be vulnerable or be seen or hit our children when they're not listening to us because we don't have the communication skills to sit down and say, hey, I see that you're hurting. We are just like, "Ah," we're so much in survival. So I think a lot of this is really going to be about having really courageous conversations. with our families and you know that's easier said than done because that's going to require a lot of the older generation to also look within and say you know I kind of maybe could have done some things differently without shame without shame because shame really is a it really is a block and an obstacle from love and change right shame is really just like when we feel shame, when we feel like we're being shamed, it's not. It, it just doesn't help in any way. We need to have these conversations from a place of openness and curiosity and compassion, <laughs> right? Not from a place of shaming, but we need to have them because the more that we hold secrets, the, the more that these generational curses are perpetuated because they're not being talked about. So we need to really shed light on them and have hard, courageous, and loving conversations ongoing so that we can begin to really witness what is alive within the family system and then slowly begin to want to change that. What, what about this do we want to change What about this do we want to see different, knowing that it's going to also take generations to break little by little? Absolutely. And Encanto, such a good movie. (laughs) Such such a good example. And I think that makes it really digestible to understand the context of this whole entire conversation, really. I wondered if you could talk about why it's important for people to access their ancestors' wisdom and how they might begin to do this and reconnect. I really see the power and importance in accessing the wisdom of our ancestors and also the connection to our ancestors because that is part of the attachment wounding that lives within us, especially if you come from lineages where there has been enslavement, war, uh, displacement, forced segregation, separation from your land displacement. There is loss there. And I see connecting to ancestors known and unknown. And that feels important to say known and unknown because not everyone has con- access to you know, their ancestors. And, and, and I want to say to these folks that we may not have access to them like know who they are, know their names, but they definitely live within us in our blood. They exist in our DNA. They live within us. So they're not lost, but maybe their identities are and wanting to honor that. But I see that connection or that accessing to ancestral energy and wisdom and medicine and practice to really be a reclaiming 
of what was taken from so many. I am going to connect with my ancestors and I'm going to I'm going to research their practices. I'm going to create my own to honor them because that is how I reclaim the fullness of my identity and my connection to them. And also I feel empowered when I feel that there is the energy of my ancestors backing me up, when I know that I'm not alone in this. And I know that my ancestors, I want to say resilience, but it's more than that. It is like my ancestors, sacred energy, their perseverance, the ways that they were able to navigate all that they did for me to be here today, that me connecting with them in the ways that feel right for me is a reclaiming of them, of me, of my identity, and holding on to the medicine that they also carry. And I think, you know, reconnecting and reclaiming, that can also lead to the breaking the curses because you're able to pass that that wisdom down to other generations as well. So that's really powerful. Thank you, because it feels like that. It feels like that. And I've seen, the more that I see people reconnect to ancestral practices that feel right for them, I notice how much more empowered they are how much more they feel like they can take on things. And it's not, you know, I have a complicated relationship with the word resilience and I know I use it in my book and I named the complicatedness in the beginning, you know, because resilience could be exhausting Mm -hmm. and we shouldn't have to be resilient when we are faced with, you know, racism and oppression in all the ways every single day that shouldn't have to be, we shouldn't have to be overcoming these things. So I have a complicated relationship with that word. And I also appreciate it because I also see it as a perseverance too. So I want to also, you know, invite people to have these complicated feelings with that word resilience. And it feels really empowering. It feels really empowering when I see, wow, my ancestors endured all of this and they didn't, they shouldn't have had to. And I am alive today because of them. And I'm going to honor them in the ways that feel right. And when I feel scared, I will maybe go to my altar and, you know, light a candle and make an offering or I'll speak to them. And that just feels like I am connected to so much more than just me. And it doesn't like I don't feel as lonely that way when I feel connected to ancestors. And I, I've i noticed that in other folks too, where it feels more empowering and they feel they're even more connected to community because community is very important, right? We can't do this healing work alone. So I found that to be really important, accessing the ancestral, just the wisdom and all of it. Absolutely. And I'm going to quote you to you for a second. <laughs> uh, in your book, you ask the question, who are you when you're not carrying burdens? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I love this question because it feels like a lifelong question. And this is part of like living intentionally and really, again, seeing ourselves. We are not our burdens. We are not our traumas. We are not what has happened to us. There are aspects of our personality that we have had to develop to fight these things or to navigate the toxic environments that you know, we are in, but we are not these coping mechanisms. We are not our protective energy. Underneath all of that, we are a core of something just so wonderful and powerful and loving, right? Like I just think about, for example, my inner critic. I I joke with folks and I'm like, I have a whole headquarter. The headquarters that exist for (laughs) inner critics, like there's like a bar, they're like employees, there's like supervisors, there's like a whole headquarters that's happening, (laughs) whole HR of inner critics. When I ask my inner critic, the main inner critic that I have, what would you rather be doing if you were not shaming Natalie when you do? What would you rather be doing? Really, this inner critic would rather be coaching me because it's not trying, even though it's it, it could be self-sabotaging and even though it could be super mean and the stuff that I, the, the self-talk that I have in my head, sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I'm so mean to myself, right? At the core of all that, or the core of all that protective energy, 
really my inner critic just wants me to thrive. My inner critic just wants me to be the best me that I can be. And so it wants me to, you know, be perfect. And it wants me to say all the right things. It wants me to know all the big words. It wants me to do all that because it wants me to thrive in this society that is so oppressive and classist <laughs> um, and racist that it just wants me to maybe hide my accent and do this and make sure I sound smart and, you know, do all those things because it wants me to succeed. So like at the, at the bottom of all that, it's wanting me to do that. So if it didn't have to be so extreme because it's burdened, right? The burdens are super extreme. If this part felt safe enough to release all of that fully, it would be a coach. It would just be coaching me on like, Hey, you know, maybe read this book to learn more about this, right? It would, it wouldn't be as extreme, but it would be coaching me. And so the invitation in that is really to see who am I and who are we when we are not carrying these burdens. If we release the extreme of these burdens and these roles, who are we? And a lot of people would say, well, I would probably be, be, I would probably not take myself so seriously and I would be more playful, right? That's probably coming because they are burdened with having to be really serious to either, you know, achieve something or, you know, whatever it is, right? But we are not the burdens that we carry and we are not the traumas that have happened. We are so much more beneath all of that. And so the goal is really to release what is burdening us so that we can like see the fullness, the fullness of who we are. I love all that response because it just really gives you permission to release that burden and ask that question and really sort of reframe all of the burdens you're carrying, as well as I like the example of the inner critic as well. Like, what would you be doing if you didn't spend all your time bashing yourself, you know? And as we wrap up, I wondered if you could tell me what advice you would give someone who's starting on their healing journey with this work. There's so much I would say, but I think one, I would say go slow, go at your own pace. Cause I think again, our inner critics, and I've, I haven't met a, uh, someone that doesn't have an inner critic yet. You know, our, our self-talk is really also motivated by comparing ourselves to other people. And so my invitation would say, I, I would say, go at your own pace. I would say, don't compare your healing to other people's healing because your healing is your own and you are on your own path and your own healing journey. So I would say, go at your own pace. And I would say that there's going to be bumps in this journey and there's going to be so much learning, so much opportunities for learning, so much trailheads and so much activation on this healing journey. And it is so worth it. <laughs> it is so worth it. You will learn so much about yourself and it takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. This has been such an important conversation. And I think so many people are going to get so much stuff from your book, learning more about themselves, really doing important healing work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cassie, for having me. And I, I, I'm just excited. I'm excited that this is going to go out in the world. I'm so excited that the book is out there. In The Pain We Carry, you'll find powerful tools to help you understand and begin healing from repeated trauma. You'll discover ways to feel safer in your body, build self-compassion and resilience, and reclaim your health and wellness by reconnecting with your sense of self and your ancestral wisdom. You'll learn how trauma is connected to grief, how it can affect both the mind and the body, and how it can persist from one generation to the next. Most importantly, you'll find the validation you need to begin mending your heart and the skills you need to live a life of intention, even in the midst of an oppressive system. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. 
Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Join the New Harbinger Clinicians Club, a free membership club exclusively for mental health professionals. Sign up today and you'll receive a special welcome gift, 35% off all professional books, free client resources, free eBooks throughout the year, access to private sales, a subscription to our quick tips for therapists, email program, and more visit newharbinger.com slash clinicians dash club for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated reviewed and subscribed to the show, and we hope you might share it with anyone who might benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.